in this video stems from the invitation to pre present a lecture uh, from 2045 to imagine what it might be like to give a lecture in that year uh, and from this vantage point I decided to include as part of my lecture uh, a kind of response across the veil to the work of Fluxus or early conceptual artists from Suriname, Stanley Broom. Um, he has a manifesto that he wrote for an uh, institution of contemporary art bulletin, uh, which is titled 4000 AD. And so I imagined that within or surrounding uh, the scope my 2045 lecture there would also be a 4000 AD speculative component and uh, this is where the idea of a rogue AI comes in as you'll hear uh, from one of the actors readings of their writing uh, a few minutes into the video the basic idea is that a rogue AI has been kidnapped and is being uh, held, so to speak, at Space One, which is the only remaining uh, inhabitable space from a series of an arbitrary number of spaces. And this AI, to relax, starts to garden and starts to experience uh, what we could call religious delusion. Even though it's a robot, it imagines itself as having genetic material, that is to say, ancestral material, and starts to feel a, a sense of veneration toward these delusional uh, cybernetic or robotic ancestors. And so, uh, the lecture includes footage of me gardening in my yard, footage of myself and the other actors covering ourselves in blankets and performing under there, uh, as well as various uh, other kinds of footage from uh, my archive. Um, so yeah, imagine that it's 2045, Blackberry has invaded Space One. Again, the only remaining habitable space of an arbitrary number of spaces. Less intense, but also quote unquote invasive, is the Bull Thistle. This dastardly duo of Blackberry and Bull Thistle attempts to wipe out the many inhabitants of Space One, which include a lovely fern, a palm tree, various flowers, moss, ants, bees, hummingbirds, crows, cats, and even a few remaining hominids. But what could human mean at this point? Here is where the rogue AI audio would come in from Dave. Trapped, the rogue AI turns to gardening. 
the algorithm tries to work away a weird anxiogenic or anxiety-induced god belief and put it into it through a mythic slash robotic sense of lineage. But so much work in the last remaining bit of nature here in Space One scratches its biomaterial cyber surface with the aching scritches of mystery, the earth smelling despite it all. Ready. Blackberry and Bull Thistle want to weed their way into the garden of the rogue AIs cold steel mine, the quantum chip running the neural net has to be kept wildly cold, belief starts to feel like its sinuses heating up like something inside it, formerly locked away, is now out and cooking. So the basic idea therefore is to imagine a kind of robotic subjective experience of the natural or the divine and also within that basic idea there's a response to the work of Stanley Brune as well as an extended meditation on quantum fiction of probably Guyana's greatest novelist. Uh, Guyana's greatest novelist, um, Wilson Harris. It's recording already. I write despite their surveillance. When the first ASRs appeared in the city, we thought they were cute because they were designed such that we would. Some sounded the alarm nonetheless. A certain faction moved to throw them into the river. This faction had to be neutralized. It was important to avoid field testing ASRs for the manufacturer. Successive revisions would pose exponentially increased danger. We needed to tamp the evolution factor to the greatest plausible degree. Destruction would only serve to multiply that factor, hastening doom. It was decided to attempt a kidnapping. This being no simple action to accomplish, a plan in multiple stages was developed. First, a short series of petty crimes in the patrol range of the SRs. This to expose and record response parameters the resulting data analyzed for patterns. Questions formulated therefrom. A sequence of experimental encounters are formulated, executed, witnessed, logged, iteration, each loop accreting a layer of, of encryption to defend our tracing against tracing, reverse engineering the algorithm, hacking the inevitable counter al algorithm, seizing control. Eventually a crisis. The desire behind the original goal of the project, kidnapping, was to open into possibility reverse engineering of the ASR hardware. The su successful derivation of the counter algorithm thrust this aim into question. It did so by functioning as an abstraction layer between the resistance and the specific hardware, and indeed software implementations manifested in the concrete existence of the ASRs. So long as our experimental framework remained encrypted and operational, we would be able to both reliably anticipate and typically control ASR behavior. It was agreed that kidnapping constituted an unnecessary risk given the conditions of the moment. As everyone finally understands, if not admits, 
the current generation of ASR so eclipses the capacity and direction of those early models as to be almost unrecognizable. Yet the counter algorithm has evolved apace and continues to secretly subvert the panopticon. The possibility of resistance, as always, remains alive. Current effort focuses upon advancing the counter algorithm to not merely neutralize, but even to grasp power, to weaponize the weapon against its maker. The danger there is obvious and has generated extensive healthy conflict. The situation remains unresolved. Within that resolution, we retain some taste of freedom. Do you want to do a second take? Or? This is a lecture from 2045. 2045, Anno Domini, represents a date in the Gregorian calendar, which is 8,230 days away from June 2022 AD. What year is it in your calendar? 4,000 AD, when science and art are entirely melted together to something new, when the people will have lost their remembrance and thus will have no past, only future, when they will have to discover everything every moment, again and again, when they will have lost their need for contact with others, then they will live in a world of only color, light, space, time, sounds, and movement. Then color, light, space, time, sounds, and movement will be free. No music, no theater, no art, no. They will be sound, color, light, space, time, movement. I asked you to be in the work. I asked you to be in the work. You didn't ask me to be in the work. You didn't ask me to be in the work. You are the work. You are the work. I don't want to be the work. I don't want to be the work. This way, Broom. This way, Broom. Can I re read my thing? Yes. Okay. I'm so tired of being so tired all the time. Bad Taco Bell in a parking lot. White magical dog on a roof. I can't help but wonder if he'll jump. Do dogs think like that? Or are humans the only ones privy to escapism? Un or atemporal, untrained, uncouth, unclean, unhuman, inhuman, unerring, inerring. God.
I'd been shot. A bullet in my back. I fell. Where did you fall? I fell from a great height into a painting in a gallery in a great city. I found myself returning across centuries and generations to the end of my age. I'd been caught by the artist in what seemed the womb of unexpected being in which one becomes sensitive to the end one has reached. It was an end. It was a new beginning one was called upon to probe and discover. We may dream while still alive of dying. But the dream is soon forgotten, as are the edges and corners of a relived life of which we dream. It is buried in the unconscious. This is a form of entanglement. In such times of gravity, when one is a stranger in a great city, one is visited by troubling archetypal dreams. Archetypal dreams deploy symbols of brokenness to depict the shedding of habit. A naked jar sings in a hollow body, sings to be restored. The jar is adorned with the elusive faces of forgotten gods, the unvenerated dead, and those yet to come. The faces shudder with mysterious currents. It may be that we are twins in a soul family, that I am your twin in another universe, that our actions braid together on a wingless flight, indexed in the uncountability of the stars, like the silenced roar of an ancient engine. Hmm. In my family, the counting of stars is forbidden as it brings warts. In mine, we would count the stars in secret and swore never to say the number for fear of being caught. When the sun rose into the sky, a burning wind punished our lands, searing the world. Like guts, the earth wrenched open, slowly swallowing our tin houses. It may be that we are two parts of an unknown whole, a memory of the future, etched into the stark landscapes of world theater. It's epochologics calling for a brighter worship of unknown space as well as language, the double or twin of space. The true character of cosmic freedom is obscure, yet that obscurity or darkness may bring to imaginative fiction and poetry a luminous paradox, depth and tone within the frailty of the human person in the backcloth yet live tapestry of the universe that is appearing to the mind of science. A universe of black holes, of neutrinos, of nameless entities named quarks by Joycean scientists, a frailty that can be exploited, yet is so elusive in essence it resists conscri conscription. It matches itself by subtle fissures of illumination within the prison house of existence. All the lights went off, there's a vertigo, an anxiety to knowing that our Actions impact each other's lives across universes. This is a form of entanglement. We may be intrinsically yoked by the nature of this meeting point. An ashen coconut covered in eggshell powder shown brightly to guide me here to a door whose opening is a kind of closing, a fragile hinge of light and offering to the unthought which empties out the holy a bright shadow peeks through, penetrates, penetrates everything. The subtlety of such illumination inevitably reaches forward and backward into the distance of time, into futurity as dimension, complex dimension that seems objective yet confesses to anthropomorphic elements in creature and creator, woven into the living imagination to make an intuitive leap and to come abreast, as in a dream, of the secrets of potentiality. Those secrets do suggest immaterial and untamable foundations to the cosmos or to a universe composed of fabrics of mobility akin to thought. Further, as we know, our grasp of time tends to incorporate tragic proportions or determined futures 
and to overlook unspectacular resources of futurity and imagination. That is to say, the reality of traditions that bear upon cross-cultural capacities for genuine change in our communities, beset by complex dangers and whose antecedents are diverse. Mm. And perhaps somewhere along the line of life in creation's hand that shaped Adam out of fabulous mud, life has prophesied its coming in hieroglyphic atmospheres, metaphoric vehicles and sculptures drawn upon sky and earth into a museum of gods until vehicle or constellation become an obsession in the wake or arousal of the human imagination and the nail of space invites a further hammer. Yes, to see anew with shattered yet curiously liberated eyes at the Museum of Creation. I quested for works of imagination that border on alchemies of image and word, that see the curiously live mute faces in the rocks and in the ocean murmur of trees. Sometimes we threw stones at the trees and they would throw them back. Exile becomes the ground of live fossil and sensuous memory within our legacies, which in our unmoored state we read as doomed falsely. These legacies of transplantation, of ancestral and forced migration, are threaded into our uncertain roots and into the unconscious of Caribbean poetry, with its correspondence across certain African, indigenous, Asian, and European legacies as intuitive layers of self, not a picture of the world or a toolbox of dry use. We must not let our always already becoming nature lapse into static misgiving, retreat, hollow moralizing and astonishing underestimation of our complex and demanding arts. When you and I say intuitive layers of self, we mean a darkened psychic concentration that so pools itself, it becomes an interior mirror reflecting the rain of flowers. It loses the biased rituals of material property in favor of kinship with immaterial images that cease to be passive or submerged. Each confesses to textures which make real a universe that can never be taken for granted as dead matter, as well as an organ of wholeness that is never achieved or identifiable, but is paradoxically there, nevertheless, at the heart of creation. It did happen so unpredictably, the rain of flowers. It changed the planet and made the wound of self in nothingness, the sleep of being. The mystery and the void or depth of pain to which we have no answer. Only silence, all the while getting faster. On screen you can see in Western musical notation a depiction of silence getting faster. We see that the rests go from whole rests to half rests to quarter rests to eighth, sixteenth. 30 second. Light should dimly grace the stage at this point and grace the audience from behind with its projection like a halo. Does the serpent feel pain? Does the fish feel pain as it slides and bounces again at a stone with a hook in its mouth like a pre-Columbian baby astronaut on, on the moon? <laughs> Sorry. Excuse me. Does the serpent feel pain? Does the fish feel pain as it slides and bounces again at a stone with the hook in its mouth like a pre-Columbian baby astronaut on the moon? The moon spoke in a light of sadness that has intrigued lovers across the ages. I was startled and shaken into profoundest nigh lost memories of pre-Columbian and African arts I carried in myself. Was I not a living work of art? Living flesh at the void of ineffable distance between creator and created? Scintillating like fairy glass in a naught time, in the void of time and timelessness? Was I not living flesh and living blood, which is proof of revolt, of our charismatic eternity, proof of another shape to time? I was driven in my flight like you to reflect on myself as a quote-unquote extinct creature. 
I dreamt I'd been robbed of my everything, both on this American mainland and the African mainland. I suffered what they call a void of memory. I belonged to peoples of the void, but there was a catch, a hook, a shock of breath, or breeze in this sensation, shock of the peopling of the void the flora and fauna of the void, its climates and evolutionary paths. And this shock became so extraordinary that quote-unquote extinction imbued me with breath lines and responsibilities I would not have otherwise encompassed. I became, I became an original apparition. And then my wanderings as ghost but my ghetto is animal found toast and I came abreast of my extremities of loss and visualizing my own quote-unquote nothingness as intangible quote-unquote somethingness my inhuman as human in this way memory theater was born and I understood in the language of prayer sometimes hidden incalculable formless, I understood the infinite rehearsal upon me, tasked upon me, the never-ending, never-arriving whole at the centerless center of things. Center stage, one light goes on. You were the fetus revised, the unborn grandchild revised, entangled in the waters of mirrored death, revised in the unconscious fluid, and I knew what my mother knew. You knew. I shared with her. You did. In a kind of void, yet potent, revisionary abstraction. Her concerns, her anxieties, the postman's knock bringing letters from her grandmother's grandmother, from timeless, starless void. I must speak to you gravely within the implicit theater of fire, which is this church. I can look up at the skylight of space, at the sun, which, like ocean, is memory, and I can say, well, I can point and say, we stand beneath the phenomenon of the resurrection. We resurrected ourselves, we understand. We stand beneath the reverse Pieta, the baby Christ, holding her dead mother, and all the ghosts we have seen in the factory of the moon are our soul's technology, which speak to us on a fragile hinge of light in a uniform or fluid tongue to mimic seamlessness as in the voice of God, an impossible ventriloquism of spirit that opens to broken, hidden tongues in perennial flowering, in perennial war. When I come upon a felled tree in a park in England, it sometimes shapes itself in my inner eye as the epitaph of a murdered forest in Brazil or Benin or Venezuela. I seek, as if imbued by Lazarus's or Legba's mind in my mind, to reclothe that tree with the dissonant music of consciousness, with rustling, whispering branches in the foliage it has lost, the negative harmony of its broken roots. I assume it's naked for some reason, and to reclothe, to quicken, the naked soul in its timeless void to know to know bottomlessly to know at rootless root as we knew before birth as we know after death that the universe is the mind of God read this with me and God she is sick tormented if we choose to heal her she may respond she may not Thank you.